This is Tim, and this is Deconstructing Comics. Welcome to Deconstructing Comics. This is Tim in Tokyo. This week, Emmett Okuna talks with Brian Kremens, Associate Professor of English at Harper College near Chicago, about his book, Captain Marvel and the Art of Nostalgia. Now, just to be clear, this is the Shazam Captain Marvel we're talking about here. Uh, In researching a book that started out as an investigation of his grandfather's World War II experience, Brian was drawn to that era's Captain Marvel comics, so the character became a focus of his book. Before we get to the interview, just a reminder that you can help this podcast by making your Amazon purchases via deconstructingcomics.com slash Amazon and make that your bookmark for future purchases. We'll then get a percentage of what you spend. It costs you nothing extra and helps us cover web hosting and the other costs of presenting this show every week. Emmett had some technical difficulties in doing the interview, so apologies for the sound quality on Brian Kremen's voice but I think you'll be able to pick out most of what he says without too much trouble. So here's the interview. Hello, everyone. My name is Emmett Okuna, and today I'm going to be talking to Brian Kremens, writer of Captain Marvel and the Art of Nostalgia. Before we get started, I'd just like to read a passage from the book. After the death of his parents, Batman seeks revenge. When Superman's planet explodes and his rocket ship finds its way to Earth, the child eventually seeks opportunity and fame in his new home. Unlike these heroes, when Billy Batson discovers the underground subway tunnel, he finds the strength to rebuild what's been taken from him, to return to the world of comfort on display in the historama. His reward for discovering that lost secret self lies in the infinite possibility offered by childhood play. Brian, I have to say, not only am I really appreciative that you wrote a book about Captain Marvel. I'm really appreciative that you wrote such a thoughtful book about Captain Marvel. Well, thank you, and thanks for having me on uh, the show. He's a character that seems to have eluded a lot of recent interpretations. Well, recent by recent, I'm, I'm talking at least four or five decades now, in that it's the childlike nature that he celebrates, and that's become point of mockery. So what was the attraction of writing about Captain Marvel to you? At the uh, at the ICAF conference in South Carolina last year, someone asked me, "You must have been a Captain Marvel fan since you were a kid." And I, uh, people laughed when I said this, but my first exposure to the character was the um, 1970s live action Saturday morning TV show. Um, I don't know if you've ever seen it, but it um, it was always the end of my Saturday morning. So I was actually disappointed when he would appear on the television in his, in his ill-fitting suit. Um, uh, and the only thing that redeemed those kind of Saturday afternoons is that my dad would make a, a grilled cheese sandwich for me. Uh. Um, so I really, uh, you know, I didn't have any sort of um, childhood nostalgia for him, which I always like to point out because I think the assumption that people sometimes have when they approach the book is that, I, that I'm sort of reviving some affection that I had for this character from my own childhood. But I, I really only rediscovered those Otto Binder and, and uh, um, C.C. Beck stories in the late 90s and early 2000s when I started reading the... Uh, I found a bunch of the old uh, 70s Shazam issues um, that had the reprints of those stories and, and had uh, some new material from back. And I love them. They, they look to me like all the uh, indie comics that I was reading, like uh, Jimmy Corrigan mm. and um, and uh, 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 James Sturm. And so I, I started to notice some similarities between them. And, and, and as you said, I was wondering why there wasn't more material on them. Uh, and I think partly it was because they, you know, they've been out of print for so long um, and really haven't been available. But I really became fascinated, first of all, by the artwork and then the sort of simplicity, yeah. but really real cleverness of the stories. And, and it was something that I had never seen, even though, you know, I started, I learned to read from comics um, when I was a kid, but those were not the comics I was reading. I was reading, you know, Watchmen and, uh, Ronin and, uh, you know, Daredevil, which I shouldn't have been now that I think about it, but um, <laughs> I was a little too young for this. One of the things that I think about when I think about Captain Marvel is that he's a superhero who represents what a child aspires to become. 
as a child. Right. He he's the yeah. adult version of Billy Batson, and in an idealized form. And right. in the passage I I read out, you you sort of touch on that because Batman is an adult fantasy of revenge. Superman is an yeah. adult fantasy of being respected by everyone and fame and so on and so forth. Whereas yeah. Captain Marvel is a child's fantasy, it's very much rooted in what a child right. might want to be. Yeah, and and it was intended that way. That's that's the other thing that really impressed me when I started to do the uh, the archival research, particularly on Back, because he really had very little use for other superheroes, and that's one of the reasons the book itself doesn't. I don't think really delves into the idea of the character as a superhero specifically, because Beck himself really considered it a character similar to. Uh, I think he called it a boy's adventure narrative. Mm. So it was more of a, like a mythological character. And he also made the suggestion later in his life that all of these adventures were in Billy's imagination, kind of like you're suggesting. So I began to read the, the stories as though they were like, I think I mentioned this early on in the book, uh, but the James Thurber character, Walter Mitty, right? Yeah. Or, um, you know, so these characters that are imagining themselves into these other worlds. And that's the way I sort of understood it as opposed to being a sort of superhero narrative. And I think that may have been a function of the fact that the people that created it, in addition to Back and Bill Parker and then later Bender, were adults, and they thought of themselves as professionals who were trying to craft this literature for young readers. Yeah, and there's a sort of insistence on getting back in touch with the childlike imagination, which fell out of favor for a couple of years ago. I think it's coming back to a degree, if you're looking at uh, any recent comics on the stands, there seems to be a reappraisal of the value of uh, imagination and a child la- childishness yeah. in storytelling. Oh. But, oh, I, oh, definitely. I think particularly in a title like uh, Squirrel Girl, right, which I love, yeah. um, the, you know, that has that quality. And it, the artwork, too, has that kind of simple um, uh, comic strip-like style that Beck prized so much in his work and doesn't have that ultra-realistic sort of um, drawing style that was popular. Yeah. Uh, as I said earlier, particularly like starting in the 1980s. Yeah. But w- in your book, you uh, I was going to touch on this later, but I think the disenchantment of the war, World War II, uh, yeah. does intrude on the book, on Captain Marvel. Yeah. And we have this sudden conflict between the aspirational whimsy Captain Marvel and then the very real, very serious issues of genocide and all-encompassing war that the yeah. kids reading the comics couldn't help but be aware of. Oh, absolutely. I think there's that scene that I talk about in the the, the, the Binder story where there's the professor that has the alternate timelines and um, Adolf Hitler convinces uh, Captain Marvel to become a, a, you know, a Nazi soldier. And there's the references in that to the concentration camps, which I mentioned in the book are, are so uh, disruptive. Yeah. To, like you said, to that fantasy world of the story. And that was, that, looking at those was um, uh, intentional on my part. And that chapter on World War II is at the heart of the book, right at the center. Yeah. Because that's really where my research started. Because the book started initially um, in research on my own family and my, my grandfather's experience in World War II uh, as a soldier. So I was doing a separate project on him. Um, and realized that I, I didn't have enough uh, knowledge of the, the, the period, you know, the context in which he lived and what he and my grandmother would have experienced. And so I did the same thing I did when I was a kid to access that world. I, I kept reading a lot of comic books, so that kind of disruption of the war mm. was something that, my, that in my own life has had a major sort of an impact, uh, you know, because he's a, he's a combat soldier uh, in, in North Africa, and then uh, survived the war, but then uh, had committed suicide in 1960. So that was my starting point, was this idealized version of the war, and then mm-hmm. what I knew of it from my own family's experience, which was a tragedy, which, which was this ongoing kind of trauma that, that went through the 1950s. Um, and even as a kid, it was always the World War II-oriented comics that I was fascinated by, whether mm-hmm. it was All-Star Squadron, you know, by, uh, by Roy Thomas. Uh, anything from that period I, I wanted to read because I felt like it would help me connect with my grandmother in some way. Yeah. And so this book is definitely a, an outgrowth of that, too, which is the kind of more personal undercurrent that flows beneath the, the research that's in there. Mm. And, and that comes through as well. I mean, the way you've written the book, uh, there are a lot of personal asides and reflection. And also you're unafraid to draw in uh, additional material to what is effectively a work of comics scholarship. Um, yeah, but you you touch on philosophy, you touch on literature, you touch on all these other elements 
to try and give a broader yeah. sense of what Captain Marvel means to you. And I thought I was very, yeah. I was very impressed by that. And and that I, I, a lot of that also was from if you go back and, and uh, read some of those early essays that I talk about in the book, like uh, you know Dick Lupoff's first essay on uh, Captain Marvel from Zero, yeah. and uh, All in Color from a Dime. It's such a personal essay, and the best writing in that piece is this opening where he remembers buying Wiz Comics number two with his brother in Florida in 1940, uh, and and that really had an impact on me when I read that. I said, well, is there a way to incorporate this very personal kind of a narrative uh, with this, again, historical archival research in the same way that he did, or in the same way that someone like Marianne Hirsch, uh, the scholars, you know, feminist, feminist scholars had a huge impact on me as well in the way she incorporates her family photographs into her uh, scholarly work. So that was also in the back of my mind when I was working on this, uh, yeah. this book to try to weave all those threads together. Yeah. Um, and after all, the title of the book is Captain Marvel and the Art of Nostalgia. So that seems like a very intentional title in terms of the art of nostalgia suggests uh, it's a far more loaded uh, than simply a nostalgic reflection on Captain Marvel. This, you seem to be trying to touch on something far, far bigger than that. Right, uh, particularly because that phrase came out of a, a piece that I had done on Walt Kelly and Pogo, and I, I kept thinking of him as, as approaching comic art as an art of nostalgia, because Kelly himself said that uh, Pogo was mm. auto, was, had autobiographical elements, so even though it looked as though he was writing about the Oki Sanoki Swamp in Georgia, which he'd never, he never set foot in until years after um, he, he'd done the strip, he was really writing about Bridgeport, Connecticut, and the, and the kind of marshy areas that are around that city. Uh, and so that's where that, that phrase came from another essay that I had written about him. And then I sort of funneled it into the, to the work on Captain Marvel. So that on the one hand, it does engage with nostalgia for the character, um, particularly those who grew up with him. Mm. Um, but then it also has a larger, um, uh, yeah, a larger sort of, uh, um, uh, meditation, I guess, on, on what it means to try to remember um, even a family narrative through the lens of these pop culture figures. Yeah. Now, um, Captain Marvel, um, again, there's something quite strange with his character because he no longer can be, for legal reasons, called Captain Marvel. He's now referred to as right. Shazam. Um, right. Uh, which, which is a whole other uh, strand we can maybe explore. But uh, what I wanted to talk about, he, sure. he has this great cast of characters, uh, both in terms of villains, a very colorful collection of villains, um, and as well as the Marvel family, but possibly the most well-known, uh, most notable Captain Marvel character is Talkie Tawny, the right. civilized tiger. And you're, I think the chapter you do on how Binder used Talkie Tawny as a way of expressing his own artistic frustrations as a writer and how this yeah. character, you allude to him as preceding Spiegelman's mouse in a way as well. He sort of anticipates that use yeah. of the animal figure in cartooning as a way of expressing something deeply personal. So you've taken away the human face and you've given an animal face and that maybe liberates the creator a bit to be a little more intimate. Yeah, That chapter alone was very moving, but also very insightful into what what Binder was trying to do. And that was that really surprised me. I, I was taken with those Tawny stories, and I've said this to, uh, to friends and, and other colleagues, that of all the Captain Marvel stories, those are the ones that I, I feel the most uh, affinity for when I was doing the research. A lot of folks said, well, you've got to talk about the uh, Monster Society people, which is my least favorite. <laughs> you know, yeah. any of those stories is probably the best known um, uh, because, you know, it's the first continuous but serial kind of, kind of almost miniature graphic novel in, in you know popular American comics, but it's just not that good as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> don't tell Harlan Ellison I said that because Harlan will call me and yell at me for saying that because he loves it. Um, but the Tawny stories just uh, before I knew that they had autobiographical elements, I just they're, they're adorable. I mean, I have no other good way to say it. And there's a, there's a there's a lightheartedness and a humor to them um, that, that's that is, that, that's also really moving. And so when I read the the, uh, the letter 
that Binder wrote to uh, Alter Ego in, 19, uh, in the early 1960s, where he said, well, those were orthodox concepts in those stories that we were trying to capture. And then I read one of the uh, back essays where he said, well, of course, Mr. Uh, you know, Mr. Tawney was Binder himself, right? Yeah. Um, and I said, well, of course, that's why these are resonating. And, and um, it, it seemed to connect in really well, not only with what Spiegelman did with Mouse, but even the more contemporary comics that I mentioned, like uh, Sam Sharp's um, Mom, uh, which I think he's doing as a full graphic novel now, which really seemed to tie in well with this kind of masking, like you said, that goes on with these these uh, animal characters. Um, it's, it's what Michael Cheney calls that, like, the ludic cipher of otherness, right? Mm. And those kinds of characters. And uh, it just seemed like a perfect opportunity to not only talk about the the, the appealing quality of those pieces, but to try to tie it in with that archival material that I had from Bender's letters, since he was so prolific and so careful about keeping records of his uh, of his life and his work. Yeah. But the records I realized were there in the stories, especially the one where Tawny's trying to write his memoir. Uh, you might remember I, I have that in the in the uh, in the chapter, and he, yeah. he throws up his papers and he says, "I'll never be famous. You know, yeah. No one will no one will ever remember me." And I saw that those, that two panel. Section and I said, well, this is Bender, right? In his in his in his loft in, uh, in Englewood, New Jersey. Um, so that that seemed like another good way to tie into that larger idea that you mentioned of this art of nostalgia, where he he was trying to incorporate his personal life into this very commercial form mm. um, that that he adored. If you read his if you read Bill Shelley's amazing uh, biography of uh, Bender that just got re released, Words of Wonder. There's a, a lot of selections of his, uh, his fanzine work where he talks about what he sees coming for comics as a as an art form, and he clearly found it, I think, even more exciting than the science fiction work that he'd done in the 1930s. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I was not aware that he um, really led to or gave Asimov that that little seed of inspiration. Uh, that was a that yep. was a nice little fact I hadn't previously encountered. Yeah, and he he was really tied into the to the to the Chicago uh, science fiction fan scene. So he knew, you know, he met Siegel and Schuster when they were still writing fan scenes because he was older and and was tied into that scene. And in here in the, here in Chicago in, in uh, the Portage Park neighborhood, there was this group of writers, Bender and uh, Otis Albert Klein, who was sort of a Edgar Rice Burroughs imitator. Uh, and they had a really tightly knit science fiction circle in the in the thirties. Um, so he was really well known, and I think um, again his name, if it's remembered at all, is, is always tied to comics. But he was a major, pretty major figure in the 1930s science fiction scene, which I, I didn't realize. I think I had read uh, maybe I Robot at some point when I was a kid. His his story, mm -hmm. but didn't realize the kind of impact that, that it had had, uh, particularly on Asimov. Yeah, yeah. Um, but again, just the the use of Toki Tony as this symbol. Um, yeah. for Binder to reflect on his own writerly status, it seems to call back again to this idea of the comic itself being a way to use the imagery of childhood and use associations that we make with childhood as a way to explore something very personal, something very directly speaking to the audience in a way that you cannot do outside of the lens of childhood. Right, and I think it was that way for Binder, and it was the same for Beck, especially the uh, the, the essays Beck was writing later in his life that were largely about his childhood. One of the yeah. last pieces that he wrote for his his critical circle, which was that group of uh, prof you know other professionals and fans that he corresponded with when he was uh, in the last couple of years of his life, and he always goes back to his childhood and his memories of his his father, who was a Lutheran minister, and he asks all the other members of the circle to tell them his, their childhood stories, and I think that was a running theme throughout all of. Uh, Beck's work as well was, was the, the wonder that he had of those kind of, that kind of childhood of innocence. Mm. Um, and, and as I probably I touch on this only a little bit in the book, but I think for, you know, Bender I think was very pragmatic and very grounded. And I think Beck, in terms of how they worked together, was the more uh, spiritually inclined of the two, probably because his father. So there, there's a mystical element beyond the kind of magic that people talk about with Captain Marvel that I think goes in the stories. But yeah. also comes up later in in Beck's life when he's theorizing comics and trying to figure out how they work, and that, that's what really struck me in reading his uh, his essays was this kind of mystical uh, dimension where he was trying to find the transcendence. Yeah. In this form, in a way that I 
I only see in, in people like Eisner or in more contemporary uh, artists like uh, Edie Fake, who's one of you know one of my favorites. Um, this, this attempt to see what's beyond uh, the surface of this, this very, what originally was a very commercial form. Yeah, yeah, and uh, I mean, you would ar- you could argue as well that the likes of Alan Moore, who you touch on. Uh, in relation yeah. to Marvel Man, because Marvel Man okay, again is yep. a sort of corollary of uh, Captain Marvel, yep. Yep. is attempting to explore the creative act of storytelling as a magical right. And exactly. I think a, f- a few more recent writers have treated of that in a very literal way. They d- they don't seem to be engaging with the playfulness of the creative right. act, yeah, especially with Moore, because as you said, he's he's he. He always had that sort of playfulness, even going back to the, even before he became a warlock, right? Yeah. For his 41st birthday, as he likes to say. And what, and he, I think I, I don't know if I mentioned this in the book, but the nostalgia that I have the most, of all the things I write about in the book, that first, uh, Marvel Man or Miracle Man story that Moore did, that's the piece that for me was the first comic I read when I was, I don't know, 12, I think, or 13, that really knocked me out. You know, that's the one. That, that's the one moment of nostalgia that if I'm trying to get back to it's that in the book. Yeah. Um, because there was something about the way he, he constructed it. And in the American version, the Eclipse one, there's the, the opening sequence, uh, one of the old Nick Anglo stories. Yeah. I think it's Nick Anglo. Uh, that at the last page of it was the, uh, was, that has the, uh, the Zarathustra quotation and the, the panel gets bigger and bigger and then you're jump, you're thrown into the, the modern story. I can still remember reading that and, and, and having to like stop for a moment. Yeah. Right? Because uh, it, it had such an impact on me. Um, uh, and more as a writer continues to really, uh, you know, affect me. I mean, even as I wrote the book, I had the deck of tarot cards on my desk and I had Brian Eno's oblique strategy, strategies and I would pull a card, both cards every day when I was working to try to get my mind right, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah, the, I, I thought um, it's like at the end of Gravity's Rainbow, you know, um, when we suddenly just veer into this discussion of the tarot right. in, in this ostensible World War II narrative. All of a sudden, we're talking about the tarot. Right. That, that free exchange of ideas. Occasionally in your book, I, I, I'm glad you say that. Occasionally, I had this sense, okay, he's he's riffing on lots of different things all of a sudden. We're we're right. going beyond multidisciplinary. We've um, we're outside that again itself. <laughs> Probably how my brain is wired. I think if you if you saw my office, that's what it looks like in here. <laughs> it's like a representation of how my head works. Yeah. Um, but it. But there's also you know I, I've started reading uh, Jerusalem, you know Moore's novel. Yeah. Um. Hopefully I'll, I'll finish it. I have, I have so many papers normally to grade that I can only devote so much time to it. You know. Yeah. Um. But it the way he tries to collapse time in that book, which he does in a lot of his work, like in Watchmen and, and uh, particularly in, in From Hell. Yes. That's what I was trying probably badly to imitate in the, in the epilogue of the book is I wanted to see if I could bring back all of the characters in the book, you know, Bender and Beck and Allison and my grandfather and, um, mm-hmm. and put them in like one room where there was no time anymore, where there was no past, present, or future, which is, you know, a mystical idea, mm-hmm. which I, I thought what I found in, in the historama, right, where Bass, Billy Bassey can see his present and his past and his future simultaneously. Um, and so the end of the book is, you know, I, I was hoping to sort of emulate that where it, all of this collapses and nostalgia is shown to be this level playing field where mm. all of these spirits interact simultaneously, which I felt was in the stories, but also is clearly in what Moore is doing. And that's always fascinated me from the very first time that I read him. Um, and, and we talked a little bit about uh, Sable uh, over email, and I feel the same way with his work. Yes. And uh, in his other novels where he's trying to collapse um, all these different time frames into one, uh, I don't know, I guess Benjamin would call it a monad of some sort, right? Yeah. Coming up, why nostalgia is ubiquitous these days, Captain Marvel's connection to King Arthur, the battle over the Captain Marvel name and various iterations of this Captain Marvel. But first, help deconstructing comics, critiquing comics, and to the bat poles move up to bigger and better things. Pledge a few bucks a month via Patreon at patreon.com slash deconcomics. Or you can make a one-time donation via PayPal. Send it to donate at deconstructingcomics.com. I'm Batman. And I'm Robin. This is Tim. And this is Paul. To To the the Bat Poles! 
The iTunes reviews are in on To The Bat Poles podcast. A terrific podcast, Raves Got A Rugrat, that brings review, film analysis, and sociological impact to episode-by-episode musings without ever losing the feeling of two brothers with towels tied around their necks running through the backyard. Unmissable. Exquisite. (laughs) You've heard the reviews, now try it for yourself. New episodes on the first, third, and fifth Thursdays of the month on iTunes or Stitcher or at tothebatpoles.libsyn.com. Wild! For nostalgia, analysis, and fun, it's... To the Bat Poles. Um, yeah, we, we, we talked about Seabold, and I, I, was, I was a little nervous about raising that because I've only read one of his novels, and it was the novel that Anthony Lane... Um, it's in that collection, Nobody's Perfect, where he talks, uh-huh. uh, I think it's Vertigo. Yeah. But one of the things I remember about the novel is that he locates, the character is traveling back across Europe. Yeah. And as he's traveling, the memories become more intense. And he's, yeah. it's almost like he's rediscovering his past. But not just yeah. his past, the, the past of everything around him uh, that led right. to his, his development as an individual. And in your book, you talk about Svetlana Bohm a lot and yeah. how she treats of nostalgia as a way of connecting with time and our past. Uh, I'm interested in nostalgia as not just an evocation of time, but as an evocation of place. And right. where we're, oh, yeah. you know, um, because I think now, because you talk a lot about nostalgia as something that is now a very omnipresent thing is ubiquitous right i suspect one of the reasons for that and i'm an i'm an immigrant myself i travel around the world i i live in australia but i'm from ireland and i i suspect that the one of the reasons why nostalgia is has such currency today is because we are all so disconnected from what was once a very definite singular sense of place and time we were all from a particular place and we were all from a particular yeah. community, and we no longer have that. Yeah, um, yeah. And I, I, I have, and that's that's something Boyum uh, talks about. She, I didn't quote this in the book, but in uh, the future of nostalgia, and she herself was a you know a Russian immigrant, yeah. And uh, writes about that experience, and and says that um, she had visited other Russian immigrants uh, as, while researching the book, and and realized that their apartments were memory museums. Yes. Right. So that they had, they were they all had become artists out of necessity almost, and inadvertently, she says, because they were trying to reconstruct uh, that home that they had lost. Yep. Um, and I think, uh, and for me, the place is essential. I, I think, um, because I come from uh, an immigrant background, and my, my grandparents are Irish, were Irish, my, my grandfather was from um, from Cary, and my uh, my grandmother, who I knew as a kid, was, was from uh, Mohill. Oh, yeah. County Leitrim. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and we still have close ties there. Like, you know, we, we go back and visit, and my, my aunt used to come over to visit. And on my mom's side of the family, um, they, they were all Lithuanian immigrants, uh, and Italian. So it was the place I come from in, uh, in Waterbury, Connecticut was this very, it was a, it was a place, at least in my family, where you had immigrants, some of whom, like my great grandmother and my mom, so I didn't even speak English. Only spoke Lithuanian for the most part, mm. and they clearly were trying to rebuild the community. And so they very much, at least the way I was raised, we were very much told about what our uh, what our past was. My de- my father in particular has always really stressed that and wanted me to see where my grandmother was born, you know, in Mohill, um, and uh, uh, had made sure I had, I had to send a copy of this book back if you put it to the, to the home country. Right? So, oh, nice. <laughs>
that even means for these characters, like Billy Batson, whose home has been taken from him by his uncle, right? Yep. I think as well at the you talk about the trial, um, the famous yeah. Fawcett uh, National trial uh, vis-a-vis Captain Marvel's um, infringement on the character of right. Superman. Um, uh, the reason I the reason I raise that now after this discussion of place and nostalgia and so on and so forth is because it comes out in the trial that Captain Marvel, uh, they argue, was inspired by the Round Table in King Arthur. Right. And yeah. what I find interesting about that is that mythology and myth and fairy tales and all these things, which were the stories that a community were found founded around or used yeah. to uh, identify values or a sense of the a sense of world, a sense of place again, um, were by the time Captain Marvel was being produced, being given to children and children only, I mean, treated as childlike things. So yeah. mythology, which is a very powerful thing, has been discarded as a childish toy. And right. in the trial, they're saying, no, our character, Captain Marvel, is an evocation of all these things <laughs> that have been discarded, right. but we're bringing it back, you know? No, go ahead. I was just going to say that even in the trial transcript, Bill Parker, the, the writer, yeah. he's got his, his book. If you remember that sequence, it's, it's uh, in his testimony in 48. Um, the uh, the defense the uh, defense attorney says, well, we put into evidence this book on uh, King Arthur stories. <laughs> and Judge Cox says, we don't need to have that in evidence. You can have your book back. Because <laughs> it was his childhood book of Captain Marvel stories. And when I, I came across that in the, in the archive, I said, I don't know if I've just tried to... It, you know, sho- shoehorn all this into my thesis about, you know, childhood memory and nostalgia, or it's just there, right? It's already present, because he, you know, he says, well, I read these as a child, and I remember these characters, and they, they resonated with me. So, yeah. it seems to be built into the character, yeah. as you're saying. I am. Um, I have a memory of, um, I had a school teacher when I was about eight or nine, and he gave me some of his old uh, Prince Valiant comics. Oh, and yeah. For this my summer holiday, so I was given some of these comics. He says, "Oh yeah, you'd like these, you know." And I took them home and I started reading them. And these must have been reprints, but they would still would have been classic. They still would have been preserved. And sure. uh, I fell asleep reading them in bed, and then I woke up in the morning and they were gone. All the, they were they were all uh-huh. gone. And my dad came in. He says, "You are drooling on those." <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> So he took them away for the summer. He's like, I'm not letting you near these. You clearly have no respect for <laughs> other people's property. So, <laughs> but these things had been handed on to me that had been from somebody else's childhood, and then I couldn't. I, I, I you know, I, I treated them badly. But this idea that well, now they're a precious thing, you know, because they, they've been they've been preserved all the time. Now they're precious. And what's interesting about comics is they are known to be disposable and we're we, they so that's why so so many classic comics have such value because they would have been discarded they would have been trashed yeah um and now we live at a time where comics are uh, treated like sacred objects so you've got right. the people who are sitting on particular comics as they assume they will become valuable at some point um or they're right. digital, which means they're they're they have no physical traits whatsoever. You you download them to your device. You know, there's there's nothing right. there for you to destroy. And yet, the storytelling has maybe not quite got the same value that it did when they were disposable. I don't know. Right, right. And I, I I thought about that a lot because in, in talking to uh, people that had read these when they were children, like Trina Robbins. And without Trina, I have to say that the book would never have happened because she shared with me all of those letters yeah. uh, that she had from, from back, which is, she was already one of my heroines from the time I was, uh, you know, a kid reading the comic buyer's guide and, and reading her, her uh, paper doll comic in the mid 80s. But the fact that she was willing to share that like, with me, um, I think ties in actually to what you were just saying, that it, it, it felt like she was passing on to me. Yeah. Um, the magic word, she, she was saying, here is what I gained from CC, and here, use it, send it back to me, don't lose it, or don't drool on it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but she said, you know, please please do something with this, and it, I, I felt that, that that was part of the, she clearly loved those comics so much, well before she knew who Binder or Beck were, because they meant so much to her, yeah. uh, or to, to Harlan Olsen, where he, he, you know, he, when I talked to him, he can be 
a little thorny at times, right? Mm, but it's really famously, yeah. Following the moment um, of, of sitting under the statue in Painesville and reading that first, or the second comic that he would take off the stack because he didn't want the first one he said because it would have an indentation on it, right? Yeah. From the wire, the bailing wire. Um, he would just sit there and, and lose himself. And as you said before, what was amazing about his memory um, was that it, it recalled to him that particular place, and he started describing his bike route from the general store, the, the cigar shop where he, was, he bought the comics, back to his house and imagining that that, that road could take him off to Cleveland. Yeah. And so there was always a location-heavy element with those memories, but they were definitely triggered by these comics that, as you said, were, were considered... Well, as Harlan himself would have said, this kind of transient, throwaway kitty stuff, I think is what he called it at one point. Mm. And, uh, and I, I, I don't know if I could, I, I tried to think about that a lot when I was writing the book because I didn't want to idealize those comics. But I was trying to figure out what made the difference between how those were written yeah. and perhaps how some of the more contemporary ones are written. And I don't know. I mean, I'd be curious to see what you think about this. I think some of it was that people like Beck and Bender had read a lot of literature and a lot of myths. Yep. You know, they were, they were highly trained. Beck took pride in the fact that he was a trained illustrator. Bender was you know, largely self-taught, but, but, you know, claimed people like Swift and, uh, 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 you know, as his influences. And I think that that, it's the same thing with Alan Moore, who's, who's getting his work not only from Bender, but from J.G. Ballard, right? Mm. Um, and so, so I think there's a, there was a sort of depth, um, to that work. And I'm sounding really old fashioned in saying this. Um, that perhaps we don't have today if it's, it's work that's purely recycling yep. existing properties or characters. And I think that's why they don't quite have the same, if they have a, a, an impact on us at all, it's a, it's a fetish impact, right? It's a, it's yep. a collector's impulse, as you said, as opposed to a um, just real per- personal kind of connection that makes you want to fall asleep reading these things. Yeah. There, there's a, uh, oh God, if, if they were actual uh, original uh, foster versions of Prince Valiant. I do apologize, Mr. Boyle, for drooling on your comics. Um, but I I just saw, last night, I just saw Logan, the new film. Oh, and, we're going tonight, actually. And there's a, I'm not, I won't, don't worry, I won't spoil anything for you. But there's a moment in it I think you'll enjoy, where Hugh Jackman's character holds up an X-Men comic. So there's actually a comic being produced in this universe about him. Oh, that's great. And oh, he, nice. He holds it up, and he just like flips through it, and he's going, "What is this?" You know, <laughs> it's just so, you know, um, he said they just they just exploited us, you know, and does he have the yellow costume in it? The in the comic, costume? yeah, he's going, "Why is look oh, at this awesome. look at this character? Look at look at what he's wearing." You know? <laughs> oh, that's perfect. I'm gonna love that. Oh, nice. It's a really nice moment. He also dismisses it because it's just it's uh it's a fantasy. Yeah. But what I thought that moment spoke to and i think it touches on something you just addressed there in the recycling comment is that the writers were throwing anything at the wall that that could stick they were they were drawing in any source of inspiration they could they were were magpies uh, writers and artists because as you as you point out in captain marvel the, the the subway tunnel sequence is stunning in terms of design and use of color and uh, the Art Deco sort of influences and everything. It's 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 a beautiful piece of art. But they were yeah. drawing in all these influences to make something new. And it was right. a, it was a mongrel art form. So you could you could do that. Like no one was going to tell you right. you couldn't. But what's happening now is a, it's something of a closed system and right. we're revisiting memories and we're revisiting characters for a commercial reason as opposed to revisiting an idea of childhood or revisiting an idea of myth, which is what I think yeah. the some of these creators in the Golden Age were doing. Which is not to say that all comics of the Golden Age were wonderful, transformative experiences oh. of literary imagination. It's just to say that the oh. ones we remember best did do that. And the best and the best of the Captain Marvel pieces, and for me they're really the ones I think of the late I did this in the book, the late forties, when it's only, it's pretty much Bender, Beck and Costanza, Pete Costanza, mm. Beck's assistant, and when it's the three of them and they don't have the big uh, team of creators, there's an intimacy to it because um, and and Bill Bill Shelley talks about this in, in his book on Bender too. Those classic creators 
were very close to each other. They mostly lived in Englewood, New Jersey, and so they had parties together, and they would get together for social occasions, and everybody from the office would come over, and there's photographs of them playing music together. And so I think that that intimacy is something that cannot be recreated. So I had someone recently ask me, well, do you think that the, the, the Captain Marvel or Shazam character can be brought back in the way that he was at the best of his those stories of the 40s? I said, well, you don't have those creators, and you don't have that intimate circle mm-hmm. anymore. That's what makes them strong. I think even we talked before about Miracle Man. Mm-hmm. Moore is very clear in that essay from the second issue where he, he remembers getting that comic on the on the uh, seashore at, when he was at holiday with his family, and that's what Miracle Man was, with him trying to re- reanimate those memories, um, which is, I think, even why Miracle Man, as brutal as it is, and C.C. Beck will probably strike me with lightning for saying this, uh, wherever he is, but I think that's the only Captain Marvel comic, derived comic, after the Binder and Beck era that captures the spirit of who that was. And I know people will not like me for saying that, given the violence of that book. Um, but I think there's something in it that, that because of its use of memory yeah. and childhood nostalgia that's threaded in there, it actually captures the spirit of those old Captain Marvel comics better than pretty much anything that came later, I think. Yeah, yeah. There's a um, sequence in Marvel Man where um, a boy in a forest encounters him. Yep. And he sees this superhuman approaching him, covered in starlight and glowing, glittering, right. and all the rest of it. And it's a really, it's a really lovely moment because it's the kid's by himself, so no one's going to believe him if he tells anyone it happened. And right. it sort of plugs into that idea of childhood fantasy again. So I think yeah. you're absolutely right. But then, in the latter Marvel Man run, where Neil Gaiman is writing it, we meet the kid again. And now he's yeah, a he's right. a he's a late adolescent, and you know, Gaiman has him uh, entry into a, a sexual relationship just to indicate that he has crossed over that threshold. He's now an adult, and yeah. he's reflecting on that moment. And I'm not sure if that's a successful follow-on from that childlike memory that more right. captured, or if yeah. it sort of spoils it in a way because now that child is no longer a child now that child it's like it's like if we if we met christopher robin you know uh, right. <laughs> as an adult you know it's sort of oh <laughs> i didn't need that you know? yeah we didn't need to see that and i wonder that's why with with more the way he ended his run on that where you have i think i quote from it later in the in the last chapter of the book where miracle man's looking down upon his domain and he, and he says that everyone can now access his stories through videotape and they're, they're becoming modern yeah. uh, legends or myths. Um, and so he has this whole fantasy sequence of what the world would look like if everyone had a, uh, a you know, a bat cave, right? Yeah. And, a, and, a, and a sidekick and have all these powers. And I thought, um, that, that ended the, the, the story, even the story of that child, I think, maybe more effectively because it was still tied into that idea that somehow you can you can try to access that innocence. Yep. But like Svetlana so Boyum says, it still might be a, a romance with your own fantasy. Yeah, yeah. And so I think I think Moore had that sense that that there's still a um, well, even in those original definitions of nostalgia from Johannes Hofer, where he says it's a it's a disturbance of of imagination and not of memory, mm. and that which Boyum really emphasizes in her work, um, and that that's something that I think Moore is able to capture that that these these innocent memories that we have might be narratives in themselves that never existed. Yeah. And that's what gives them, as he says, their point. Yeah. I, I think for anyone listening who has not had the pleasure, um, we should probably make clear that you can use the titles Marvel Man and Miracle Man interchangeably. They're both, yeah. it's both, <laughs> it's the same book. <laughs> I, um, I, I got a, I got a peer review at one point when I was doing, uh, it was the original, uh, version of the World War II chapter that was published in Studies of American Humor uh, as a standalone piece, or part of it was, and then, as I said, I rewrote almost all of it. And uh, I, I had only called you Miracle Man, and the, the anonymous reviewer said, I hope you're aware that you were called Marvel Man. And <laughs> 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 I created him, and I, and I, I said, is this an actual care edit, or is this, a, is this a nerd battle that we're having? <laughs> <laughs> and I, of course, put a footnote, did you 
correct that, but I felt very, my 13 year old self felt very challenged at that moment because he would suggest that I didn't, wasn't aware of Dead Skin and Warrior. Right? <laughs> well, I mean, so. it, it is, it, like, it is a fascinating postscript to these characters, uh, Captain Marvel right. and Marvel Man, that any character with the name Marvel has had a very troubled legal history. Um, oh, oh yeah, and uh, it's it's something of a it's it's continuing happening, and now we're having uh, next year we're going to have a Captain Marvel movie, but it's not Captain Marvel; it's uh, a whole other character from Marvel Comics who's called Captain Marvel. So just to really confuse matters and uh, um, turn things around. Yeah, that, that came up during my when I got the. Uh, the peer reviews for the book from uh, from Mississippi uh, from the press. Mm. One of the one of the early reviewers, um, and this was a, an interesting suggestion, said, um, it, you know, or said to my editor, Are, is he planning to talk about the other Captain Marvel? So is he going to talk about uh, you know Captain Marvel and then Monica Rambeau and all these other figures? Yeah. And I, I wrote a because I'm overly obsessive about these things. I wrote a ten page response <laughs> as to why I was not going to do that. <laughs> Marvel, sadly, the original Captain Marvel has been battered on all sides because not only uh, has he been challenged to because he's not marvelous enough, um, but he's right. also been challenged because of the association with Superman and right. con the continuing su subordination of him to the last son of Krypton. Right. He can't be his superior. He has to be less than. You know, he can't. You know, he will either be. Uh, brainwashed villain in Kingdom Come, where uh, right. you know, they have a they have they finally have the grudge match of the century, and he's he's got a he's got a little insect in his brain. Uh, Mister Mind is working right. away in there, a derivative of Mister Mind, and um, right. in in Final Crisis, Grant Morrison has him presented as an analog of Superman, so he simply is another right. Superman in effect, uh, right. which seems to be an endorsement of the national case against Fawcett. about this, and I, I, I said this also to someone recently, is that the, the best of all tech work is, is, is available digitally, so you can go online and read all the software, right? But you, but you can't get a nice uh, sort of fancy fantagraphics edition, right, of the yeah. Tawny story. Like yeah. You can't get the, uh, the best of their late 40s work, probably because of these legal issues, right? And, yeah. and when, when DC republishes that material, like the 75th anniversary one that came out last year, we don't really see the I think the extent of that, the achievement of that work, yeah. um, within its context. And, and that's one, of the, I think one of the sad parts that I think, I honestly think even Beck himself felt at the end of his life that the work was, he was so excited when the Monster Society of Evil was going to come out in a hardcover edition, yeah. which was happening right, right before he had the last stroke that really, really, um, eventually led to his death. And he was so excited that Gary Groff from Fanographics was going to help bring it out because I think he wanted that, his legacy and Bender's legacy to live on. Yeah. And it wasn't looking that hopeful at that point. Um, and it, I, I still think it's a shame. I'd still like to see a, a good collection of that work so people know the difference between the, the original Captain Marvel, right, and the, mm. the, uh, the later iterations of the name. Um, yeah. You see, it's, again, uh, because, you're, because you're exploring... Um, this notion of Captain Marvel as a character in a particular time and place and as a symbol of a particular time and place. You don't really go into a lot of recent attempts to sort of shoehorn the character into no. uh, DC proper, uh, if you want to call it no. that. But one of the few ones that I read recently that I thought was interesting in terms of having an artist who has a similar interest in just using simple illustr illustration styles was Jeff Smith's. Uh, was it Shazam and the Monster Society of Evil? Or yeah, that came out about ten yeah, years ago. Monster, his Monster Society of Evil, which was about almost ten years ago, I think. Yeah. Now, but, um, 
Yeah, and I think that one, particularly because of Smith's um, work on Bone, he, he, he really, I think, was an ideal person to sort of bring into that mm. that story um, because of that kind of, like you said, his simplicity, and I think captured more of that spirit um, and was able to recycle, you know, as I said earlier, a concept that, that if you go back and look at the original stories, they're so fraught with so many of the racial stereotypes of the period. Um, you know, there's a lot of controversies as to what, why that's not been republished uh, subsequent to the, the 1989 version of it. But, um, you know, they're, they're very disturbing. And without the, the right amount of context, they're not the ones that are um, would be very appealing to a modern readership. So the fact that he was able to sort of take that and represent it to a younger set of readers and take the best of it, I think, was, was valuable. I think there was also a valuable lesson in how he did it because he had yeah. the the sort of feel and classic touches that we associate with Beck in terms of the simple lines right. again around the face. Um, but the story itself was very much set in contemporary time. Right. And you had uh, a lot of allegory, allegorical readings of what was happening sort of the Bush era in terms of yeah. you have the Rumsfeld character who appears in the story right. and uh, it seemed like a great use of the character uh, retaining a lot of what makes him work and then yeah. using what we are currently uh, living through to uh, tell yeah. his stories. Whereas previously attempts like I would think of just League International in the 80s where you had Giffen and so on, they make Captain Marvel almost moronic <laughs> in, right. in his childishness, right. which is a huge disservice to the character because it's not that he's an idiot. It's that he no. he is full of laughter and he enjoys what he's doing and he's having fun. Like, that's not yeah. being an idiot. And that's one of the objections Beck had to the scripts that he was getting when he, he came back in the, in the 70s on the revival, that the longer it went on, the more he felt that they were treating the character, as you said, like an idiot. And that's, he said, that's not what we intended. That's not at all what this character was supposed to be, which is ultimately why he only lasted about nine or ten issues on that series. And then said, I'm retired. I'm done. Yep. This is not a, you know, I'll write about, I'll write about comics and I'll do my paintings for fans that want me to recreate covers or panels, but that's, that's it. I, I, I've said that I, I would, if I, if anybody gave me the opportunity to do this, I would love to do a collection, almost like the, uh, pieces Marvel was doing maybe about 10 years ago of, of a lot of the alt comics or indie creators doing Captain Marvel. You know, this is why I asked Tyler Roberts to do the cover for the book because I wanted to see what someone like someone like her would do where she, she writes so much about childhood and so yeah. much about memory and also about place that she seemed like the ideal person. So if, if I had my dream, uh, I would put together a collection of her and, you know, John Porcelino and Ben Passmore and, and Isabella Rotman and Marty Galloway and have them all do Captain Marvel stories. Yeah. Because I feel like those younger um, indie comics creators, um, I think somehow would get the spirit of those stories better than the more commercial, um, uh, you know, artists that, that, that work within the field of superhero creators. And not to take anything away from those folks either, mm -hmm. but, but I think the character belongs to a, a different, a slightly different tradition that doesn't entirely work in the way that he's typically been used over the last maybe two decades. There was a very exciting um, revamp of Steve Gerber's Omega the Unknown, again, yeah. uh, almost 10 years ago now, and it was Jonathan Lethem and Dalrymple doing oh, the art. I, how was that? I never, I never read it. I'm a big fan of the original uh, series, too, from the 70s. What, what, did, what did you think of it? Well, I thought it sort of engaged with the elements of the original series that nobody else picked up on, which is that the ordinariness of a superhero right. in this New York setting. And we're talking about rent and we're talking about uh, right. neighbors and just, and you know, occasionally they'll be attacked by robots, but it was also right. this idea of how strange it is to introduce a superhero to a world very close to the one we live in. And right. what Lethem does is he takes the weirdness and then he makes right. the weirdness almost in your face ordinary. So there's a right. massive conspiracy involving fast food in it. And there's, again, there's lots of androids and robots, but they behave in odd ways and they say odd things and you just think it's a crazy person. But no, it's a sophisticated right. android. So he, he seemed to be teasing out the theme of Gerber's, you know, what happens when these extraordinary uh, 
has a head-on collision with the very ordinary. And right. I really like that. I thought, and, and it completely, as you're, the reason I'm talking about it is because you mentioned that these independent artists would maybe appreciate some of what went into the original stories more. It's because it's such a break away from the typical model. That's what makes it work. Right. It's something, it's something fresh. Yeah. And to go back to what you said, because when, when Beck and, and Bender and, and Bill Parker and, and, uh, other people like Manly Wade Wellman and, uh, and Mark Swayze and, and uh, uh, Kurt Schaffenberger were doing those book, books for Boston in the 40s, there were no rules. I mean, they were, I mean, yeah. Beck was literally writing up the rules for his artists in his, in his, uh, in his group with, uh, with Costanza because they had their art staff. And so he, he, he was able to show them, here's how we think we should do this. And there was, like you said earlier, there, there was a greater freedom there, which is um, why I, I do think that that spirit of freedom is, is closer, at least in, in, uh, in American comics right now, in that indie world, maybe than in, um, in, in the mainstream world. But, but as you said, but there's exceptions to that with something like Squirrel Girl and, uh, and uh, other books that Marvel, I think, particularly has been doing recently. There, there's an openness, I think, with what they're doing that's, mm. that's maybe bringing in more of that independent spirit, which I, I find exciting and a lot more interesting yeah very good well i was going to ask you uh to finish i was going to ask you what your thoughts were on the upcoming film but we don't really have a lot to go on beyond the rock is in it and that could be good <laughs> yeah i i originally had a longer section on the rock yeah and in the final chapter of the book i reduced him i shouldn't have done this to use the rock but i turned him into a footnote uh. Uh, but I, I was going to use him to sort of reflect on what the movie might look like, and the less information I found out about the film, the less I could write about it. Yeah. Um, but I, I would love to see him as, as Captain Marvel if they just let him use his charm and his sort of goofy personality. Yeah. I, I think it could work really well. I, I'm not sure what they're doing right now in terms of turning him only into Black Adam, who only appears once back in the 40s, so I don't say anything about him in the book. Yeah. Um, but I, I'd be curious to see how they're going to approach that because I think it could it could work if it, if it were turned into something like uh, what's the what's the animated film also from about a decade ago the the Invincibles I forget the name Incredibles, of it Incredibles the Incredibles um, with the family of superheroes that that's closer I think in, in spirit to that original Captain Marvel than uh, uh, those dark DC movies that we've been getting in the last few years Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And um, as you mentioned, The Rock, I think I I don't understand why he's playing. Uh, Black Adam, I, I agree with you. I think he should be Shazam. Um, yeah. Because not only would it be, um, again, very useful to have uh, a non-Caucasian superhero on screen who can be an aspirational model for a kid out there who wants to see that on screen, you know, who has yeah. has a hero that he or she can, can live up to, which I think is part of the Captain Marvel appeal. Um, but yeah. he's such yeah. a fun performer. Like, um, yeah. If you ever see a movie that The Rock did called, it's not a good movie. Uh, it's called The Tooth Fairy. He co-stars with Julie Andrews, and there's, oh my God. there's a moment when she's scolding him, and yeah. he he mimics her voice back at her. <laughs> it's just like don't bother with the rest of the movie. It's terrible, but just that little, uh, it's, you know, it's it's a child kids movie. But the moment when The Rock takes makes fun of Julie Andrews <laughs> to her face in a take, and none of them crack up, is amazing to me. I think that's just a great moment. No, he's he's totally delightful. I'm sure if CC Beck were still with us, and if Ben Bender were still with us, they would totally be on board with him playing Captain Marvel Shazam, which we'll have to call him. Yeah, because he does. I have to do this. I I, I don't even know about film. But he's so charming. Yeah. He's so funny. And, and as you said, he, his appeal would, would attract so many different, uh, so many different kids from so many different backgrounds. And that, that, that is the dream of Captain Marvel is that you can get a magic word and you can, you can, you can, you can dream yourself back into the home that you always wanted, right? So yeah. what, what better actor than The Rock to do that? And I say this shamelessly because if I can get a photo of, of me in my book with The Rock, I would be happy, right? That's a good goal to have. Me. That's a great goal to have. You know, that's like, yeah, I don't, other academic, people love it, read it, and it touches them. That's cool. But if I could just show it to The Rock and, and get get on his Instagram, I would be, I would be a very delighted human being. <laughs> let's, let's make this the goal of this podcast. Let's get on The Rock's radar. I think that's the way to go. Let's see, 
I'm there. I, I, I'll fly out to L.A. If he wants to come here to Chicago, we'll take him out for dinner. We'll take him out for a good vegetarian meal. I'll, <laughs> I'll show him all my old cats and all the time. Yeah. Brian, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Is there anything particularly you'd like to mention before we close? Well, one thing I always say to people when they ask me about the book is, is to read the footnotes because there's a lot in there. Maybe there's too many footnotes, but also there's some jokes in the footnotes, <laughs> um, and I, I, which I threw in there, which probably probably only my mom will understand. And even the uh, even that uh, the index has a few little uh, running in jokes in it. So if people pick up the book, try to read the, the back matter, I guess. Very good. Very good. And um, you're on. You have a blog on WordPress. It's bw crimmins, yeah. isn't it? Dot WordPress dot com. It's it's my uh it's my full name. Yeah, Brian W Kremins dot WordPress dot com. And that that has uh, I update that pretty regularly. I slowed down a little bit in the last few months as I, as I was finishing the you know the proofing for the book. But I'm going to be adding updates um, uh, and probably writing some new stuff. I, I'm I'm sort of on a writing moratorium for the first day of spring. Um, then uh, I'm going to try to get back into the to the blogging again a little bit. Very good, very good. Um, well, listen, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Um, thank you very much for taking the time. I know you're very busy, but I just want to say it again. Love the book. Really enjoyed it. Thanks. And uh, I think I'm going to revisit it now, given some of the insights you've given me. So uh, uh, thank you very much. Well, thanks, Evan. And thank you so much for, for inviting me. And it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Next time you come through Chicago, we'll, like I said, we'll take you out. The Rock might not be with us, but we'll take you around. We'll find you some more, we'll find you some more Prince Valiant comics and you can replace the ones that were taken from you when you were a kid. <laughs> Sounds good. Cheers. Okay. Great. Thanks. Talk soon. Thank you. Captain Marvel and the Art of Nostalgia is published by University Press of Mississippi. Brian's site is brianwkremens.wordpress.com. You can write us at mail at deconstructingcomics.com or look up Deconstructing Comics on Patreon, Twitter, Tumblr, Facebook, and YouTube. All our social media links can be found on the right sidebar at deconstructingcomics.com. Also, please give us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. Our theme is from bensound.com. Last Thursday on To the Bat Poles, we discussed the team-up between the Penguin and Marsha, Queen of Diamonds. Up to this point in the series, it's the most sitcom-like the show has gotten, but we found some interesting aspects of it nonetheless. Look up To the Bat Poles wherever you find your podcasts or at tothebatpoles.libsyn.com. If you're looking for some constructive feedback on your comic, send it to us and Mulele and I will critique it on our spinoff podcast, Critiquing Comics. Send it to mail at deconstructingcomics.com and please try to keep it to about 30 pages. A new episode coming up this Thursday right here in this podcast feed. Then next Monday, I'll be talking with Jim Zub, writer of the image series Wayward, which is set in Tokyo. He's also teaching a comics class in Toronto and doing some work for Marvel, currently on Thunderbolts and later this year on Uncanny Avengers. We'll talk about that, some right and wrong ways to get noticed in the comics industry, and more, so be here next week. Till then, this is Tim, and thanks for listening to Deconstructing Comics. <laughs>